Good morning. Welcome to our latest virtual bridge session. And this time, it's all about the money, <laughs> which is why I think, you know, I would have thought we would have been filled to the rafters. I mean, this is, this is the real opportunity to hear from somebody who, oddly enough, gives out money or gave out money and just to find out exactly how do we get that money? I mean, like, really, why wouldn't you want to turn up to this? <laughs> I'm sure I'll edit that out and say something much more diplomatic in a second. But <laughs> let's let's just get to the main show. So, Gordon, tell us, how do we get the money? Well, what I'm going to try, <laughs> am I going to be able to share my my screen here, Kenji? Or... You are. You, you have full rights. Um, okay. So can everybody see that? Okay, grand. Okay, thank you very much now. So this is, um, just to talk about what I'm gonna, gonna cover here, I, the, the, the kind of caveat at the outset is that this is very much a personal view. Um, so my experience is that I spent a number of years as head of scholarship and learning at the Robertson Trust, which is the largest independent grant maker in Scotland, um, gives out about 20 million a year in total in grants. And of that, we spent about three million a year on education projects, um, two thirds of which was really on funding students through university, which I'm not talking about today. And a lot of my work was around that. And the other million was in um, partnership projects in education. And we did work with uh, Fourth Valley College and with Fife College and Borders College in the FE sector and with St Andrews University and some others in other sectors. Um, the main reason I'm saying this is a personal view is that my work was very much developing joint projects. So it wasn't with people coming to me with a cold application saying, here's my application, what do you think? It was us identifying people we wanted to work with and then jointly coming up with the proposal that went to our trustees for approval. So it was a bit of a different process to my colleagues who are the grant managers where you just literally submit an application online and they tell you yes or no, we're going to fund it or not. Having said that, you can't spend time in these organizations without it rubbing off and without um, spending a lot of time with those colleagues discussing their view of grants. So some of the things I'm going to talk about here are to do with what I know they will look for and think about, and particularly what they will think about in terms of FE and understand or not understand. And I don't think any of them are in the room, so that's fine. I can say there are definitely things they don't understand, and that's going to be a key part of how we frame this. So I'm also going to, so I'm going to set the scene a little bit, talk about impact, talk about understanding of other people of what you are funded for or not, a little bit about the S word, which I'll come back to when we get there, and something Kenji's already touched on, actually, which is about being clear and not um, trying to pull well over anybody's eyes. But, but mainly, I think, a, a, an encouragement to actually make sure we do apply for grants from funders, because there's a lot of opportunity out there to, to get things. So setting the scene, uh, and I think I'm preaching to the choir a lot here, but so apologies if I'm telling people things they already know, but there are a number of places for which you could apply for a grant. Uh, and for me, the three key areas are the companies and corporate social responsibility side of things. And it's worth thinking about CSR because there are definitely circumstances in which going to a company might be better than going to a grant making trust. And I'm not going to dwell on this one, but when I go on to some of the things you might think about without being unkind, because actually this is changing as well and companies are maybe being more determinative about this. But an example of this that I would give is that I've been approached a number of times when I was at the Robertson Trust for things like um, I thought there was a fantastic project in a college where they wanted to do a, a science um, project with schools. And what they actually needed was a van to drive around the schools and take the science materials around the schools. And they came to us and said, we want to apply for a van. And we said, well, we're not going to fund you for that. We'll fund you for the whole project. But that was funded from somewhere else. And what we suggested they do, and this is really obvious, was go to one of the car companies and say, would you sponsor a van for us? So there are certain things where you might want to go to a company that's got corporate social responsibility is looking for projects. And they will want to spend their CSR money. And they'll be quite, they may well be quite glad that you've come along and said, I've got a project, I want to do this, it will really help the community. And as I say, this is slightly changing. So I don't want to suggest that this is um, the only way that they work. Some of the corporate CSR is getting much more like a grant making trust now, but without being funny about it, some of them want their name up there. And if you're prepared to put their name on the side of a van, they'll fund you for the van because they want to be able to say, look, isn't it great we're doing this? That's not cynical, it's fine for them if that's what they're after. 
So think about think about co companies and corporate social responsibility funds because they're worth having a look at. And there are some big ones. ESF Energy, for example, funds smart stems and do it to quite a high amount, I think, and do it really well. The second one and the main one we're going to talk about is grant making trusts. Um, if you go to um, a, a website like Scottish Grant Makers, for example, if you Google Scottish Grant Makers, you can find a list of a lot of the grant making trusts in Scotland on the Scottish, who are members of Scottish Grant Makers. There are some big ones, there's the Robertson Trust, there's Cora Foundation, um, there are there is Ganaki, there's uh, Northwood, um, and lots of others. Some of them are more local. So some of them are in a specific area. So Northwood, for example, as some of you may well know in the room, will fund in the Dundee area, Dundee and Tayside, but certainly are unlikely to fund you if you're in Lanarkshire. Um, Ganaki will fund you in Perth and Kinross. Wood Foundation particularly will fund in the Northeast. So it's worth doing a bit of background research to these trusts, how much they give and look at their um, strategies. And I'll come on to that. And the other one is what I'm calling the national bodies, which is kind of overlap with grant making trusts, but things like the National Lottery, um, who you can apply to funds for. And there are some Scottish government funds that will come out at certain times and invite people to fund for. So often those funds will be put through another trust. So for, as some of you will be aware, a lot of the um, recovery funding that went out through COVID to the third sector was Scottish government funding, but it was for a foundation that actually managed the grants and so on. So sometimes it's government grants going out to other bodies. So the key point here is, as I say, is check the strategy. What are their priorities? What You mu must, must, must look at these grant making trust websites, look at what their priorities are, what they're looking to fund. Um, so again, I'm going to speak about Robertson Trust mainly because it's the one that I'm most familiar with. Their new strategy, which launched a few weeks ago, is about poverty and developmental trauma and how we support communities to develop and to overcome those challenges. So if your project is not something that you can structure around those priorities, don't apply to them um, because you'll, you'll fall at the first hurdle if you're not around that. So for example, it might be that a STEM project is relevant to that, but you're gonna to have to make your STEM project relevant to poverty and developmental trauma or it's not gonna get funded um, by that particular trust. Um, Timescales and processes. This is something that when you're in the grant making sector, all the people applying for grants plead with everybody to have aligned processes and so on, but of course they don't. So you've got to check when do they look for applications? When do they make decisions? Do they do it regularly? Some of them will do it once or twice a year. Some of them will do it, do it four times a year. When are their deadlines? And you have to factor in these timescales because it's no good saying, right, we've got a project that we want to start in February. We'll start applying for money now. And I know a lot of you know this already, but you may well be making an application and you know the current funding round might make a decision in April. So the funding will come out in June. So you need to be sufficiently far in advance of that. And the other thing, and I think this is really important because it's amazing the number of people that don't do it, is can you talk to them? Robertson Trust runs seminars and I really recommend if you want to reply to them, you do this. They run seminars called Giving Time. And if you look at their website, you can book slots of the Giving Time seminars and you can spend half an hour or 15 minutes having a conversation with a funding officer and saying, if I put this forward, what do you think the response will be? What would you recommend I do? And, you know, I can't emphasize enough, speak to the trust, speak to the people at the trust and find out what their priorities are um, because you need to align with that and they'll give you good advice. Um, so what is it about? Okay, so the things you need to think about is the impact your project's going to have. And I, I appreciate this probably sounds obvious, but it is really something that you, sometimes people don't do. So is what you're doing new? It doesn't have to be, but is it a new thing? Is it a new idea? Is it different and innovative? So are you doing, are you trialing a new thing? Are you trialing a new service? Are you trialing something that's a new way of working with your students, a new way of supporting your students, a new way of doing teaching and learning? Um, do you want to work with a particular community? And it's a, is it something that hasn't been tried before? So a, what will really excite the trust is if you're saying we want to do this thing, which we've maybe seen happen somewhere else. We want to try it in our area. We want to see if it will make a difference. And what are you hoping to achieve from it? So what is the impact going to, to be? You, you won't know whether it will work or not. That's fine. You're allowed to try things and see if they work. But what are you actually going to achieve with this project? Who's going to benefit? 
Is it the students that are going to benefit? Is it the community that's going to benefit? Is it the wider college that's going to benefit? And how will you know? And all these things need to be spelled out in the application. And that how will you know is a really important point. How will you know that it's had an impact? How are you going to measure this? It doesn't have to be incredibly complex, but you have to know how you're going to measure the impact. Is it just in numbers? Is it X number of people signing up is success? Or is it more intangible than that? Is it in about 80% of people saying they benefited from the project? Or is it, as a lot of the projects I've worked on, really, really tangible? Is it the students are in the college and being successful rather than not being in the college and not being successful? So there's something about that. And I think the thing is, and it's back to something Kenji said at the beginning from other things he's heard about, you know, almost treat the funders like idiots. Don't treat them like idiots, but treat them as the people who don't understand you or what you do or why it's important. And you have to explain it to them. I've had so many conversations with people who say, but isn't it obvious how um, important what I'm doing is? Well, it is to you, but it's not for, to anybody else. Um, so leading on from that, um, and I've called this, this slide, aren't you funded for that? Um, this is really important. And this is something that I've, I've talked to a lot of colleagues in the grant making sector who don't know FE. And I'm not, this is an absolutely serious point. They, when they get an application from a college, will look at your college strategy. They will look at your college outcome agreement and they will say, hang on, you're funded for that. That's what you get your funding for. Teaching students, funded for that. Bringing, you know, working with communities, you're funded for that. It says so in your outcome agreement. So you need to spell out why that's not the case for this project. Now, we all know in this room, because we all work in colleges, that the outcome agreement covers loads of stuff that you don't actually get funding for, because that's the way that it, the system works. I, I read through a college's outcome agreement a couple of days ago, and it was 45 pages, and there was loads of stuff in there that isn't directly funded. So you need to be clear in the application, where does your organization's main funding come from? In this case, it's going to be SFC. And what is that supposed to cover? And why is your project not covered by that? Because you have to be able to show why can't I get the money from somewhere else? Why is it not? So if you're talking, for example, about student support, isn't it the college's job to support the students? So why do you need extra money to support the students? Now, we all know why. We know that you need to do extra innovation. You need to try new things. You need to develop areas where they might not work. So really be clear about why your project is not covered and why this grant. Why is it this grant that you're applying for? Because the danger here is that you sound like you're just saying, right, I'm, I'm just sending. It's a bit like, um, I'm going to use this analogy a couple of times. It's a bit like applying for jobs. As you, you, I'm sure most of us in this room have done recruitment. You know really clearly if somebody's just sending the same application to everybody in the hope that somebody will give them a job without tailoring it to the job. It's the same with grant applications. You can tell if somebody is just saying, right, I've got a project and I'll forward it to 25 different funders and hope somebody funds me. You've got to spend the time understanding why this grant is appropriate for you and why you want to work with this funder. Because funding's a relationship. It's a partnership. And you've got to build a relationship with the funder and say, why would they work with you? Why will they feel good about working with you? Um, and choose your ask and your timing carefully. So we've talked about when the, the timings for the grant application process is. You need to ask at the right time and you need to be careful who and how you're asking. Um, sustainability is the S word in case anybody was wondering. Um, so sustainability, funders like to see themselves having an impact on in the long term. So is, is this activity one off? And how are you going to continue it when the grant stops? Is there an institutional commitment? Now, if you're innovating, then you would expect that the institution is going to say, right, we don't have the funds to try this thing. But if it, we try it and it works, we're going to carry on doing it. What a funder doesn't want to hear is we'll try it. If it works really well and everybody benefits from it, we can only carry on doing it if you keep funding us. And if we don't, because you're saying, you know, we've got this great thing, it's really benefiting the students, you're going to want to embed that in your institutional practice. Now, the trick here is that think of it as what will change as a result of the project. So we all know that you may well struggle to carry on a very specific project with a specific staffing because you've got costs attached to that. But what are you learning from the project? Will it provide good practice? So an example here with one of the colleges that I worked with, 
was that they were very clearly able to draw a line from the project that we funded to the fact that the way they supported their students had changed as a result of the learning from that project. So the project might not continue, but they've changed their practices and students will benefit as a result. That's a good story to tell. That's something that you can say, look, as a result of this, we've learned that we've developed and we do things differently now. Um, so will there be another phase or phases to it? Are you likely to want more money for it? Because you can flag that up and say, we see this as a number of phases, but be very clear how you're going to take it forward. Because there's an element of this that says, if this is a really good thing to do, why wouldn't your institution do it? Now, in these straightened times, we can all think of reasons why not, but you've got to be able to explain that. This has kind of been running through the, the, this like a thread, but funders get loads and loads of applications and they know what they're looking for and they know when you're being vague and they know when you're being evasive. They want to know the details. They know if you're pulling the wool over their eyes and saying, well, we're a bit vague about this bit, maybe this will work. But the key to this is they want to fund you. That's what they exist to do. So they're not there to reject your application. They want to fund you, but you've got to give them reasons to do that. And you've got to be, so in other words, so also be clear about the cost, be clear about things. Don't think, well, I won't mention that bit because that might turn them off. We'll bring that in later when we've got the funding. Be very, very clear with them that, spell it all out, budgets, spell them out. Don't, I mean, I've spent so much time when I've been working on funding, going back to people and going, I don't quite get this bit of the budget. What are you actually gonna spend on that? Um, you know, you've, you've quoted 25,000 pounds for equipment. What's the equipment? Um, why does it cost 25,000 pounds? So forestall some of the, um, the questions by being clear. So give as much detail as you can on budget and cost, what success looks like, which is really important, as I say, and the risks and challenges. You're not required to do something you know is gonna be successful. That's the whole point of trying new projects and trying new innovations but you need to be clear that you understand the risks. Robertson Trust, for example, will ask you to fill out a risk register as part of the process of getting the money and be clear with them what you think the risks are. You're allowed to have risks, just be clear what they are. So I've kind of rattled through that because I want to leave time for people to ask questions, but the key messages for me, for me are, you know, there is funding out there, there's lots of grant making trusts out there and they do have money, and you have a great project. I don't know what your project is yet, but I know it's a great project. So believe in your project. Talk to the funders. Please, please, please talk to the funders. And I think I noticed Pauline from Fourth Valley College popping onto the, into the room. So I'm sure Pauline can talk a little bit about why it's a good idea to talk to your funders. Um, know your stuff. Know the answers to the questions and don't be put off. I mean, I know that we, we already know that there are people out there who've been rejected lots of times. Don't let that put you off. Just try and learn from that. Ask for feedback and go back around the cycle again, because as I say, people really, really want to fund you. Um, so I think I've, I've really rattled through that because I know we don't have a huge amount of time and I wanted to get the key messages in there and allow time for questions. So I'll stop there. And um, that I think Kenji gives us about 10 minutes for a bit of a discussion before the official end. OK, yeah, absolutely. So. Does anyone have a question for Gordon? And and remember, he's not long out of the David uh, Robertson Trust, so he's he's still, you know, that the the feeling from the hat that he was wearing is still there. So this is the time to ask any tips around, you know, what you might encounter or what you might be doing if you're if you're considering a bid for funding. So Andrew, yes, of course. Yeah, uh, just a uh, bit of a strange one for me, but. If a student association, for example, was going to apply to a fund for a project or uh, for certain funding, would the college's income affect uh, what the student association could say apply for if they're not a charity separately? Um, if you're not a charity separately, then I suppose it, it might in the sense that you're not a separate organization, so you'd be looked at as the whole charity. But I still think what you would do you're, you're in a position where the college gives you funding in order to run. So you can be clear what that is and you can be clear what you're given that funding for. So I think the argument still applies that you would say, well, we're funded for X, but we want to do this. So we need some funding to do that. And I, and I think I'd, I'd personally like to see more student associations getting in the game with these things, because I think, you know, you know, the needs of the students more than anyone. And 
showing that development is really good. So I think um, I think it's the upfront thing again. Yeah, you would have to do it as part of the college if you don't have a separate charity identity, but you can still be clear about your funding. And, and you know, so nobody's going to look at that and say, well, I suppose maybe the additional thing you might want is why, why is the college unable to fund you for that? In a, in a sense. So if you've got somebody from the college able to give you a statement that says, we really like to see this project happening, but for these reasons, we can't fund it. That would probably be a help. Okay. And Jason? Uh, yes, I've been around in JISC for long enough from the part of the time when JISC was a mini funding body itself. Um, and um, yes, the number of applications that we saw that didn't bother with the criteria. Which, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but my question is about this. Um, so quite often we found that many applications downplayed risks and didn't want to deal with the risks of the project not working because it seemed negative. Um, mm. Would you have any comment or advice on how you deal with the, the risks that a project faces when it's making an application? I think, I mean, I certainly think dealing with it's important. And I think for me personally, risk is fine because the whole point of these projects is innovation. So you're going to accept a certain amount of risk. You're going to accept the possibility it doesn't do what you want it to do. But the key thing is being very clear on how you're going to mitigate those risks. So I'm trying to think of an example, but you could say, well, I mean, there's a risk that not enough people sign up for this. or there's a risk that we can't work with the community. Some of it is about being prepared. So some of it is do the risk register really early and try and eliminate some. So if your problem is, we might not get enough potential partners for this project, then get the partners before you make the application. Um, that sounds really obvious, but actually sometimes it is sort of make sure you've done that. Um, and I think, again, I would say talk to the funder in advance because the funder's risk appetite is relevant here as well. So some funders might be saying, well, we're not keen on funding something that's complete shot in the dark. Other funders might say, well, actually, you know, we're quite happy to do that. The other thing I should have mentioned, so it's not really a risk thing, but it kind of links to that, is that when you're looking at funders, increasingly there are some funders that are prepared to give less limited grants. So I'm talking here about funding for a particular project where you're funded for, say, a two-year, three-year project with outcomes. But funders like Esme Fairburn and actually the Robertson Trust and its new strategy are now talking about open and more open, unrestricted funding where the, they like what the organization's doing and they want to fund them to carry on doing what they're doing. This might be a challenge for colleges. I don't know whether we can get colleges over the line in these because that gets back to the problem about whether you're funded already to do what you do. But there is an assumption that if you build a relationship, a trust relationship, then funders are willing to say, actually, we're happy to support your overall aims. Um, and a lot of us did this going into COVID. I mean, I, spent, I, I gave a lot of people I was funding permission at the beginning of the lockdown to... Um, to remove the restrictions and use the funding for whatever they needed to use it for to kind of keep going. So there's a bit of kind of looking out for unrestricted funding. And I, there's a, a question for another day on whether colleges are going to be able to apply for unrestricted funding from, from funders. But I think the main thing is, I, I, if it was me, I think I'd be including the risk register in the application almost and saying, well, we've considered the risks. There are these risks. And as long as the funders going into it with their eyes open. And you must have found that, Jason, at, at GISC when it was funding, because there were bound to have been projects where it might or might not work. Indeed, and often it um, was, were the projects that relied on one person or a few people, and uh, and then the <laughs> person got another job just as funding was granted. Indeed, or or such. Um, but yeah, many types. Yeah. Of those, uh, they were considered to various extents um, in the application process. Gordon, um, a couple of areas. I suppose one that I'm interested in is many smaller organizations or organizations that don't work in a particular stream where the funding is pitched consider partnerships applications. So do you have any tips around when you're considering working with a partner and putting together a bid with a partner, how you manage that process? Yeah, um, I think, I mean, I think, I would say, I think it's a really good way to do it. And I think it's, it's always good to see partnership bids. Um, I think, particularly with partnership bids, it's good to see what my old boss used to call a bit of skin in the game from the partners. So it's always good to see the partners putting some of the funding up themselves. Um, so I think if the partners are getting together and saying, well, between us, we can do X, but we're applying for funding to get the bigger project going. And I think you've got to see the way that the partners are working together 
So I suppose in a way it's the same kind of argument is do a lot of the work before you actually go as far as applying for, for funding. Um, and you want to see how each partner is going to contribute. So it needs to be very clear in that application. The other thing I would say is it needs to be clear where the money's going because for example, and I can only speak about Robertson Trust here, but I imagine it's the same for most funders. We could only fund the person doing the work. So what you couldn't do is go into a partnership and say, right, we, the FE College, want to do X and we're going to pay um, Kenji Lam Associates to do the work. So we're applying for funding to give to you to deliver the service. Robertson Trust won't do that. It can't fund third parties. It can only fund the person doing the work, if you see what I mean. So you've got to be careful that you're not, I mean, you can pay people to do things for you as part of the project. What you can't do is commission someone to deliver something for you and then go for funding to pay that person to do it. It's got to be that they want to fund the people who are actually delivering the work, not third party funding, because the danger then is that they can only fund charities. So if Kenji Lam Associates is, a, is, a, is not a charity, you could end up with the funding going somewhere where it shouldn't be, shouldn't be going. So I think it's got to be really clear the basis of the partnership. Um, and it's back to my point about be very, very clear how that's working. So don't make that murky. Partnerships are great as long as it's clear what everybody's contributing. And you can spread your risk that way as well. But um, have those open partnership discussions before you start because partnerships can go badly wrong as well as we all we all know. Um, but I've, I've worked with some really great partnership approaches. I mean, the First Chances Project in, in Fife, which Robertson Trust funds is between the council, the college and the university, and it's an amazingly successful project. Uh, and that's with um, effectively about four or five partners now. Um, yeah. I, I should just point out that my rates are really, really reasonable. Just, you know, just to clarify that. Um, <laughs> um, so any other questions uh, for Gordon? All right, I realise there's been chat going on, which I haven't been looking at as well. Um... One, one other thing that I'm, I was interested in is you mentioned impact in, in the presentation slides. And increasingly, people talk more about impact. Do you have any tips around how you measure impact or, or give a realistic estimation of impact that's actually going to be a result of the, the project that you undertake? Yeah, I think it's, um, I, think, I think realistic is the key word you use there because you've got to be, in me measuring impacts really is really hard. I mean, that's why, you know, people employ evaluators specifically to do that. And I, th I think, um, a couple of points. One is, one, I would say, make sure you've got some kind of independent measurement of impact. So cost that in, um, because there's lots of people out there who will do evaluation for you. Um, and do that from the start. So make sure that the, one of the best, most important points here is include at the outset how you're going to measure success. That sounds really obvious, but it's amazing how often people don't do it. It's amazing how often they set the project up, it all starts, and then somebody says, how are we going to evaluate this? and um, build your evaluation in from day one, speak to specialist evaluators about how you do it. And then just be, use a combination of the kind of um, qualitative and quantitative, the best impact measurements both. So you're gonna look at numbers, you're gonna look at how many people are we gonna be involved in this, but you're also gonna look at that qualitative, what are people, how do people react to this? How are they reacting as people, as emo their emotional reaction to it? Um, that's probably not incredibly helpful. I, I think there's um, the main thing is to think about those different aspects of it and have it there from the beginning. So you've got a bit of kind of if enough people are involved in this. Um, I actually think in some ways it's, it's not easier, but colleges have got an advantage here because you can look at student success. So what you can do is you can say if students are still, I mean, you know, on a really, really basic level, one of the projects I funded was about is the student still in college at the end of the year? Uh, and it can be as simple as that. Don't so maybe one of the points here is don't try to be too clever, um, because it actually could be enough. It could be as good as if we keep the students in college, they're going to succeed. Ultimately, in some way, shape, or form. If we don't keep them in college, they're not going to. So your impact measurement could simply be: Are they still there, and did they achieve what they set out to achieve in the year? 
Um, and I think funders, as a funder, because of the nature of the work I did, we were always quite flexible on this in that we were, we were willing to change as we went along and say, well, it wasn't quite doing what we thought, but we'll try this instead. Some of the bids were actually to be really specific about it and, and try not to deviate from that. So I think, okay. you, yeah, you're going to have to cut me off there, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That that really does come to the end of our recorded part of this virtual bridge session. But I, I, I do want to and stress, I think one of the strongest things that you pointed out is always speak to the funders mm -hmm. uh, wherever you can. Um, just, just pick up the phone and, and talk to them because it, it can make all the difference. Okay, thank you very much, Gordon. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us for this virtual bridge session. And if you're watching on YouTube, hopefully we'll see you again in a live session. So until then, stay safe.